Good morning, everyone. In this video, we're gonna be covering lesson C on hyperbolas. So this is our last type of conic that we're gonna be covering. So first, looking at the shape of this conic, a hyperbola is made of two swooshes. So one equation, two pieces to the graph. And I don't show the second orientation um, for hyperbolas here, so we're gonna go ahead and do that down by these definitions. A horizontal hyperbola, opens left and right, like the image we have above, but then a vertical hyperbola opens up and down. So similar to how I can have a horizontal ellipse or a vertical ellipse, I can have a horizontal or a vertical hyperbola. Now, what's kind of annoying about the hyperbolas is they share a lot of similarities to ellipses, but we can tell the shape is very different and everything's just slightly off as far as the definitions go and the equation. So the tough thing from here, now that we feel comfortable with ellipses, is learning hyperbolas without getting them confused. So first key feature wise, a hyperbola has a center, which is the same as the ellipse. It can be found from the H and K values, but notice in the vertical hyperbola equation, the K and the H are switched around in the equation. Also kind of interesting is the center is actually outside of the hyperbola swooshes instead of inside. Now our vertices, similar to our vertices for an ellipse, are A units from the center. Our transverse axis has a length of 2a, and it is between the vertices. Transverse axis, length of 2a, between the vertices. So our vertices are going to be kind of the middle points of the swooshes. So that would be a vertex, that would be a vertex. So they could be stacked up on top of each other if it's a vertical hyperbola or left and right if it is horizontal. So vertices, similar to ellipses, are still A units from the center. So this distance is A, and this distance is A. And our length between the vertices is 2A as well. So we're calling it the transverse axis and how I remember that the transverse axis goes between the vertices is that they both have VER in them. And you may be wondering, well, isn't that kind of the same thing as the major axis? Like, why don't we just call it the same thing? The transverse axis is different because it is not necessarily the longer axis. Major implies bigger than minor, but the transverse axis is just between the vertices. So it might be shorter than our other axis, it might be longer. It all depends on our A and B values. Now our next axis is the conjugate axis. Now the conjugate axis has a length of 2B and it is between endpoints. Now the endpoints, we don't actually graph. So they exist, but they're not really considered a key feature or something that we plot when we are graphing a hyperbola. But for reference on our diagram, let's just say I'm gonna go B units up, and be here, and B units down, and be there, B and B. This would be a, we'll say E for endpoint, this would be an E for endpoint. Now, this length is the conjugate axis. Whereas this length between the vertices is our transverse axis. Transverse, think vertices. We do have foci, which similar to ellipses are C units from the center units from the center. And these are always on the transverse axis. 
So similar to how our foci for ellipsis are always on the major axis. So it corresponds with our A units on that same axis, so on the transverse axis. And they will always be inside the curves, which is helpful as well. Now, the last key feature that we don't necessarily, um, that we don't have on here explicitly written out is the asymptotes. So I want you to go ahead and add asymptotes. You've seen this word before, probably in Algebra 2. An asymptote is something that a graph approaches, but it never actually touches. And our asymptotes are important because they are going to help us figure out how wide or how tall these curves are going to get. So our asymptotes have a slope of plus or minus rise over run. That plus or minus is a very important detail because on this graph, we actually have two different asymptotes. We're going to have one that goes through the center, up this way, with a positive slope. So there's my positive M asymptote. And then we will have one going down this way, which is when we have Oop, I wrote plus again, is when we have a negative slope or a negative M value. So what's important about this is it shows me that these curves are going to keep going outward, getting closer and closer, but never actually touching those lines. So the asymptotes really help me figure out how wide those U's are going to be spreading out. So there's two asymptotes, one with a positive slope, and one with a negative slope. Ooh, and let's go ahead and draw our foci on this diagram as well. It's starting to get a little messy, but our foci would be here-ish. And those would be C units away from our center. So we've kind of got a messy little diagram here. There's kind of a lot going on. Um, something that I want you to take note of, excuse me, is the conjugate axis. If I slide my conjugate axis over to my vertex, so if I slide this to be lined up with my vertex point, like here, what we're gonna find is that that conjugate axis actually hits the asymptotes. And we can do the same thing over here. I can take the conjugate axis, slide it, and as soon as it hits that vertex, we would see that it hits, and I didn't draw a perfect asymptote over here, but it would hit the asymptote line. So it kind of makes this box shape that has A and A and B and B as kind of those side pieces. And that little box shape is going to be helpful to us when we start trying to find the slope of those asymptotes when we are just given a graph. So take a deep breath, and now we are ready to move on to the standard equation of a hyperbola. So notice that I have a horizontal hyperbola and a vertical hyperbola. So I do have an orientation for these. Now, unlike ellipses, where I determined horizontal or vertical based on the bigger value and which it was below, you determine your direction based on which variable is first in the equation. So, because x is first in my equation, this is a horizontal hyperbola. In this one, because y is first, this one will be a vertical hyperbola. So I want you to state that order of X and Y determines orientation. Or the direction. So it determines whether it is horizontal or vertical. The next thing that I want you to note about the standard equation for a hyperbola is similar to an ellipse. Both of these equations 
have equals 1 on the end. So the circle has equals r squared. Both an ellipse and a hyperbola have equals 1. The other thing that's interesting about a hyperbola is that instead of having a plus in between the fractions, our hyperbola has a minus. So again, similar to an ellipse, but very different in how it looks and how we determine some of these key features. Now, as we mentioned above, the transverse axis is not necessarily the longer axis. And another thing to keep in mind with this same statement is that A is not necessarily bigger than B. A is not necessarily bigger than B. It might be bigger, it might not be. So with ellipses, my A value was always bigger, but for hyperbolas, my A value is always first. So that means A squared automatically goes under that first fraction. A squared automatically goes under that first fraction for the vertical hyperbola as well. So I want you to just put a side note by this that says A is first. So A is first. And turning back to our ellipse section, put a little note that says A is bigger. because that's gonna be one of our key differences in identifying those pieces in our standard form equation. So if that's a squared, then that means b squared goes under the other fraction. So b squared and b squared. All right, so as I mentioned before, our center is at hk, but the thing you have to be careful about is the order. So careful with order because in a vertical hyperbola, my y fraction is first, which means my k value is actually going to be stated first. But if this was negative two and this was negative one, I would still state that coordinate as one, two. So it's still hk, even if the k value is stated first. So that's the only thing to really be careful of with your center. Next, the asymptotes, oh boy. Okay, so folks, for the asymptotes, the only thing we need to find is the slope. And slope, we know from our Algebra 2 days, is rise over run. We are going to include a plus or minus in front of that to denote that we will have both a asymptote going up and an asymptote going down. This is what I want you to memorize. The technical definition is that it will be equal to plus or minus the square root of the y denominator over the square root of the x denominator. But again, open, you guys can't see that. So m equals plus or minus the rise over the, and I wrote rise two times. Need more coffee, <laughs> rise over run. So M equals plus or minus rise over run. This is the definition I want you guys to focus on. Although the more specific definition is plus or minus the Y denominator over the X denominator. So folks, in a general sense, the horizontal hyperbola will have asymptotes, slopes of plus or minus B over A. And vertical hyperbolas, will have a slope of plus or minus a over b. I will tell you from teaching this, it is very, very difficult to just straight up memorize this and keep it straight. And same with this. Instead, focusing on that rise over run definition is really what's going to help you. So if I look at this first equation and I think about rise, which variable corresponds to rise, x or y? Well y is rise or the upward direction. So my rise comes from this denominator, b. So we'll go ahead and write rise there. 
and then my run comes from x. So I use the square root of that denominator. So rise, b, run, a. Now in my vertical hyperbola, when we think about rise over run, my rise is y, and so my a gives me my rise value. My run is x, and so my b value gives me my run. So we're gonna be practicing this a lot in the homework packet, but keeping this stuff straight and keeping it straight with what we've already learned about ellipses is kind of what makes this challenging. And here's where it really gets wild. It says foci are c units away from the center along the transverse axis, same as before. However, our relationship that, um, that goes between our a, b, and c values is c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So unlike ellipses where I had a minus in between those values, where that's not the Pythagorean theorem, here for hyperbolas, I have a plus sign. So our c value, square root, square root, will be plus or minus the square root of a squared plus b squared. And remember, as we said in unit one, I can't distribute that square root to both of those and say it's plus or minus a plus b. You have to put in the values, simplify them, and then take the square root of that one thing. So folks, here is how we are going to remember this relationship. Hyperbolas have a minus in the equation, but a plus in their ABC relationship. Ellipses, have a plus in their equation, but a minus in their ABC relationship. So they switch signs based on what they have in the equation. So knowing that hyperbolas have a minus sign is going to help you figure out that ABC relationship. So folks, we are now in the, well, in the next video, we are going to look at the practice set.